Today's presentation will be given by Sylvia Lintner, Assistant Professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan and our newest uh, faculty associate at the China Center. She's also the co-founder of the Shanghai-based research hub Hacked Matter, which focuses on interdisciplinary scholarship on cultures of technology production in China. She researches, writes, and teaches about do-it-yourself maker and hacker culture with a particular focus on its intersections with manufacturing and creative industry development in China. Her uh, research is supported by the National Science Foundation and many other uh, foundations and uh, grants. And today she will be speaking on hacking with Chinese characteristics, the making of a powerful vision of change. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much for being here today, and many thanks to Mary and Ina for making this happen. Um, is there some feedback? Okay. Um, well, as Mary was saying, I will be talking about hacking and making cultures in China today. But um, before I actually delve into that, I want to start with the following quote by President Barack Obama. So this was in 2012 um, when Barack Obama proposed to allocate 1 billion US dollars of investment for the buildup of a so-called national network for manufacturing innovation, stating, we are Americans, we are inventors, we are builders, we are Thomas Edison and we are the Wright brothers and we are Stephen Jobs. That's who we are, that's what we do. We invent stuff, we build it. About a year later in a 2013 State of the Union address, the president proposed that a so-called maker approach and digital fabrication tools such as 3D printing would be crucial in enabling this revamp of the American manufacturing industry and to guarantee that the next revolution in manufacturing is actually made in America. So the US president here speaks to a much more growing and broader interest in the potential impact of a so-called maker movement or a maker approach towards technology innovation education and economic growth. So this contemporary maker movement is thought to enable a move from tinkering and play to prototyping and entrepreneurship and finally to help revive industries and sites of manufacturing lost due to histories of outsourcing. So the US government is not unique in this. Um, making is drawing investment from many gov governments, venture capitalists and corporations around the world. So while the US government promotes digital fabrication and, as, and making as a way to return to made in America, the European Union, for instance, has introduced formal policies, policies aimed at rebuilding manufacturing capacities and know-how in order to sustain their knowledge economies. And just recently, in another part of the world, um, which we're going to focus on today, during an official inspection tour to the manufacturing hub Shenzhen just in January this year, the Chinese Prime Minister Li Keqiang visited what the government considers important sites of Chinese innovation, the local hackerspace Chaihua. So this in visit included not just the hackerspace, but also big corporations such as Huawei and the private bank Tianhai WeBank. Li Keqiang lauded Chaihua, the hackerspace in Shenzhen, for its entrepreneurial spirit and proclaimed that its innovation attitude was to be supported by government initiatives. So just a couple of weeks later then, in a state council meeting, the government of Shenzhen declared the buildup of a China so-called mass makerspace to promote innovation through venture capital, incubator hubs, and entrepreneurs. So not just governments, but also large international corporations have begun investment in this so-called maker-hacker approach towards innovation, including Intel, Foxconn, Ford, Texas Instruments, Stratasys, Disney, and the Knight Foundation, to name just a few. In 2013, for example, Intel introduced the Arduino-compatible Galileo board, and the, the packaging is here on the screen, which is an Intel Inside microcontroller platform aimed at branding Intel as a champion of the maker movement. So you might want to ask now, what is going on here? And what in particular do governments and corporations talk about when they talk about making as a site of innovation? So who here in the audience has actually been to a hackerspace before? OK, a couple of people. So let me briefly explain what a hackerspace and what, what making actually is. So this is a photo of a hackerspace in Shanghai. Hackerspaces are basically community spaces um, created by people committed to new approaches towards technology production use and design based on the open sharing of software code, of design schematics, and of knowledge writ large. 
So many hackerspaces are committed to expanding ideas of the open source software movement, the free and open sharing of knowledge and ideas to hardware. So what you find typically in a hackerspace is open source 3D printing tools like this one here, but also soldering irons and microcontroller platforms. And these are shared with a community of members. They usually pay a membership fee um, and people from the wider public come and can attend workshops on the weekends, for example. So um, this hackerspace here is really, this one in Shenzhen is part of a larger movement. And Arbo, for example, has two hackerspaces. One is just down on, on Liberty called All Hands Active. And by 2010, this whole movement began around 2006. Um, by 2010, there were more than 1,000 hackerspaces in, existent, in existence worldwide, so really making it a global phenomenon. Much around these open tinkering spaces was propelled forward by this little microcontroller here called the Arduino. It's one of the first open source hardware platforms that made hardware tinkering available and affordable to many people. So what the Arduino allows you to do is basically create a bridge between the digital and the physical world. So for instance, by attaching sensors to this board, you can connect activities in the real world, like for example, movement or changes in, in the light in a room, for example, to trigger changes in the digital world. For example, have movements trigger sound or trigger changes on a screen, for example. So makers who meet in hackerspaces um, share tools like the Arduino, but they also go and talk about what they do and share it with other people. So one of these venues that has proliferated around the world is the so-called Maker Fair. So Maker Fair is basically a public event that originated from San Francisco and is used by makers, tinkerers, individuals, but also companies to show off what they are doing with open hardware technology. It attracts the event, the annual fair in San Francisco, attracts around 100,000 of people um, every year. So this is just a little bit of background, what is going on in around making. So um, across these sites, making is envisioned, as I you know, started this talk with, as a revamp of how manufacturing and innovation in manufacturing is done today. And one of the crucial players that has emerged in this vision of transitioning making from a hobby into a professional site of industrial innovation is the city of Shenzhen. Who in the room here has been, here, been in Shenzhen before? Okay, a couple. So Shenzhen for the others is um, a city in the south of China bordering Hong Kong in the Guangdong region. And until recently, very few technology researchers um, or makers of that matter paid much, paid much attention to Shenzhen. That began to change when a growing number of hardware entrepreneurs, hardware tinkerers, makers, traveled to the coastal metropolis to turn their ideas in smart home, in wearables, into actual products. So one known example of these made in China devices are, for example, the virtual reality goggles Oculus Rift here on the screen which were recently bought by Facebook for over two billion US dollars. Or the Pebble smartwatch, which raised the single largest crowdfunding campaign in history, over 12 million US dollars. In 2012, one of the first hardware incubator programs, Accelerator, opened its offices in Shenzhen, attracting startups and investing in startups to come to Shenzhen and work with factories to implement, again, ideas conceived of in hackerspaces into actual products. Other investment programs such as Highway One, Bolt, and Dragon Innovation followed suit. Since 2013, the MIT Media Lab has organized tours for its students through Shenzhen's electronic markets and factories. So in a recent blog post, for instance, Choi Yi, to head of the Media Lab, records his somewhat astonished impressions describing local factories as, quote, willing and able to design and try all kinds of new processes to produce things that have never been manufactured before. So in my research, um, I'm curious to understand how did Shenzhen, once known as a site of cheap and low quality production, become the place to be for contemporary hardware innovation? How does the story of Shenzhen fit into the broader innovation discourse that surrounds making? So drawing from approaches in science and technology studies, in my work, I answer these questions by tracing the machineries of production. So what does that mean both the material the cultural and economic processes that go into producing Shenzhen as a new global site of techno-scientific innovation. And in doing so, I look at what is produced both socially and technologically as Shenzhen is being remade. 
I trace the specific consequences the discursive and the material remake of Shenzhen has on flows of money, people, and resources. So I draw um, in my work broadly and also in this talk today from ethnographic research I've um, conducted in China since 2010. So this included tracing China's maker movement, both from the establishment of China's first hackerspace in Shanghai in 2010, all the way to its intersections with manufacturing and industrial production and entrepreneurship that we see today. I spent several years on the ground in makerspaces, um, studying the social organization and the technology production of these community spaces. This was in cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, Ningbo, and Hangzhou. In 2012, Part of this research, I joined as a researcher, a startup from Montreal that had moved to Shenzhen to implement a product idea. So this research then included in-depth observation at the local incubator program that the startup had joined, but also participation in day-to-day -day businesses like um, going to the factories, sourcing components at the electronic markets, pitching in front of venture capitalists, and so on. Last year, then, I began to focus in particular on the site of Chinese manufacturing conducting interviews and observations at factories in Shenzhen. And in my talk today, I'll draw mostly from findings um, from the research in Shenzhen. But I'm happy to talk about some of the other things later on as well. So a little bit about Shenzhen, and some of you might know this. Um, Shenzhen is a very young city. Uh, what was a fishing village only 30 years ago quickly transformed into one of the largest manufacturing hubs in the world. So this was in part enabled by the implementation of a government policy that declared Shenzhen and the region around the city a special economic zone. In 1979, when the, Shenzhen, uh, when the special economic zone policy went into effect, Shenzhen had a population of around 50, a little bit under 50,000. By 2010, it had morphed into a metropolis of over 10 million people. So the growth of Shenzhen coincided with and was propelled by an outsourcing boom, to quote Lithier and his colleagues, um, emerged from the massive restructuring of the US information technology industry that began in the 1980s. Throughout this period, companies in the US and Europe moved their manufacturing facilities into low-cost regions of the, of the so-called developing world. Shenzhen then constituted a particularly attractive site as a special economic zone. The barriers of entry for foreign corporations were drastically reduced. For example, a range of incentives, including tax reductions, affordable rents, and investments aimed at in integrating science and industry with trade. So with the gradual upgrade of technological and organizational skills in Shenzhen over the, year, over the years, the city transformed from, low -cost assembly, from a low-cost assembly location <coughs> Um, into large-scale contract manufacturing. And one of the most well-known examples in this space is the ODM HTC, for example. So contract manufacturers who came up with their own brands. So as contract manufacturers grew in size, and many of you might be also more familiar with the, the organization and the company that produces for Apple, Foxconn, is also has, has facilities in Shenzhen as well. So as these contract manufacturers grew in size and began cat catering exclusively to large brands, a network of entrepreneurs saw an opportunity to establish themselves in the gaps of the global economy. And this is something I've become particularly interested in um, in my research in Shenzhen. So there's basically a dense web of manufacturing businesses that emerge in Shenzhen catering towards less well-known or no-name clients with smaller quantities, which the large ODMs did not anymore recognize. This, these less formal manufacturers also known as Shanja in Chinese, are compromised of a horizontal web of component producers, traders, design solution houses, vendors, and assembly lines. They operate through an informal social network and a culture of sharing that has much in common, actually, with the global maker movement, though motivated by business and necessity rather than countercultural spirit. So Shanja translates into English um, as mountain stronghold or mountain fortress. So it connotes an informal outlaw tradition comparable to sort of the Robin Hood connotation. Um, the term has been used in China for a long time, has been featured most prominently in folk stories like the Shui Hutuan, water marchants, um, that tells the adventures of 108 rebels who hide in the mountains and fight the establishment. Building on this common narrative, researcher Lynn Jeffrey, for example, describes Shanghai as the story of, quote, outlaws who have gone away to the mountains doing things with their own rules. There's an element of criminality about Shanghai, just the way that Robin Hood is a bit of an outlaw. 
but it's really about autonomy, independence, and very progressive survival tactics. So this term Zhanzhai was first applied to manufacturing in the 1950s to describe small-scale family-run factories <coughs> in Hong Kong that produced cheap, low-quality household items in order to, as Josephine Ho put it, mark their position outside the official economic order. They produced counterfeit products of well-known retail brands such as Gucci and Nike and sold them in markets that would not buy the expensive originals. And you see some, you see some of these versions here on the screen. As electronic manufacturing migrated to Shenzhen, the informal network of Shanghai manufacturing found a perfect product in the mobile phone. Shanghai production includes not only copycat version of the latest iPhone though today, but also new creations and innovations. For instance, it was the Shanghai ecosystem that first brought to the market the dual SIM card phone, which was later copied by Nokia. And you see some of these versions here on the screen. And I brought some of them with me today. So this is from my most recent visit to Shenzhen. So this is a phone that's shaped um, like a Hello Kitty. Or when I bought this, I was told this is for the female boss, a phone for the female <laughs> boss. And in this one here, I was told, I um, bought this like half a year ago, it's the, the newest iPhone 6. <laughs> so within China, Zhanzhe devices are catered towards low-income migrant populations that could not afford more expensive branded products. So Zhanzhe phones have a strong global market. They aren't a niche industry, so to say. It's a multi-million dollar business, targeting low-income populations, not just in China, but also in India, Africa, and Latin America. So here you see some more examples the one that I just passed around. So as the Shanzhai ecosystem matures, we are also beginning to see the development of branded phones. Xiaomi, for example, is an affordable smartphone that comes with a chic design and makes use of sophisticated branding techniques. Although it grew by leveraging the Shanzhai industry, Xiaomi is rarely associated with it. Rather, it has become widely accepted as a national brand that many Chinese are proud of. Another example is the joint venture of a French and Shenzhen-based design firm. And I want to quickly show their promotional clip here just to give you sort of a sense of this sort of new branding that has become part of the Shenzhen production as well. So in my research, I was then very curious about um, what actually goes into producing these devices. Who makes the Hello Kitty phone? And who makes, who makes the, the female boss phone? So after a series of interviews and observations with different entities in the Shanja ecosystem, I um, began tracing the functioning behind this um, ecosystem here. So what you see on the screen um, are so-called public boards, or gongban in Chinese which are production-ready boards designed for end-consumer electronics as well as industry applications. So this particular gongban here is the public board for the production of smartwatches. So during my research in Shenzhen as part of this um, investigation or engagement with the Shanzhai ecosystem, I followed closely the process of one of the region's largest distributors and their internal design house that produces about 130 public boards every year. The design solution house does not sell any of these boards, but rather gives them out to potential customers for free, alongside a list of components that go into making the board, as well as the design schematics. The company makes money by selling the components that go into the board and into the product. As such, it is in their interest to support as many companies as possible to come up with the creative skins or the creative shells, called gongmo in Chinese, that are compatible with the board. So you could think of this here sort of being, being the shell and the skin of the board. So the customers then basically take the board of their liking as is or build on top of it, advance it, make more of it, 
uh, and then design their own casings. For example, one board can make many different smartwatches or can make many different phones. So the phones that I just passed around, many of them are made from the same board. So in 2010, which was years before Apple Watch, which I introduced earlier, or, or even the Apple Watch were announced, 30-some companies in Zhenzhen utilized this Gongban public board ecosystem to produce um, smartwatches. So in other words then, the Gongban public board functions like an advanced version of an open source hardware platform like the Arduino, which I introduced at the beginning of the talk. Yet it differs in that it constitutes a bridge into manufacturing. So while the Arduino is a prototyping platform that is used in hackerspaces for prototyping and tinkering, um, the, the Gongban is a public board that is used um, in manufacturing and can directly translate into, into manufacturing and into production. So while some people associate Shanghai with stealing and low quality goods, there is a growing endorsement of Shanghai as a prime example of Chinese grassroots creativity that has innovated on, open, on an open source approach applied to manufacturing. So one strong, strong proponent of this approach is David Lee, who you see here on the screen, who is the co-founder of China's first hackerspace, and by many also co called China's godfather of making. So David suggests Shanghai is hacking with Chinese characteristics. <coughs> Shanghai is open source in practice, he elaborates further. This is different from the West, where open source only exists in theory. David Lee here refers to a highly efficient manufacturing production system that is wrapped around the Gongban open board manufacturing <coughs> technique that I was just describing, that rests on principles of open sharing, as I elaborated earlier. The Gongban Design Solution House give their boards out for free. They share the bill of materials for free, um, again, with the motivation to generate profit and to make business. So it's an open source mechanism that's applied to manufacturing and to business. We call this Shanghai in Zhenzhen. It's a mass production artwork, explained Lawrence Lin, the head of the distributor's design house that I spent a lot of time with during my research. To Lin, there is no question that Shanghai is more than just a simple process of manufacturing. He says, first, Shanghai needs creativity. It is something only a person with a quick reaction who knows the industry chain very well can do. Shanghai makers are asking themselves what the normal people will need next. It is very important that you're very familiar with the upstream and downstream industry chain. And there's a kind of hunger. These three elements together make it an artwork. It's about being hungry for the future. So Lawrence Lin Research and Development Unit is one of many corporate entities in the Shanghai ecosystem that has grown over the years into a substantial business. This growth has occurred outside the traditional IP regime using an open manufacturing ecosystem rooted in these open reference boards I was just introducing and a culture in which the bill of materials is shared. This open culture of production has enabled local chip manufacturers, so competitors to Intel, for example, such as Allwinner and Rockchip, to compete with in an international market. At the crux of this manufacturing process, however, is their speed to market, driven by what Lawrence Lin described in the earlier quote as a hunger. In the Shenzhen uh, eco, in the Shanghai sort of manufacturing ecosystem, ideation, prototyping, and design happen alongside the manufacturing process, rather than how we might very often think about it when we look at the back of an, of an Apple iPhone is that design happens before the actual manufacturing process. So products are designed in relation to demands of fast-changing markets. Rather than spending months or years deliberating over the next big hit, Shanghai builds on existing platforms and processes, iterating in very small steps. In this way, Shanghai brings new products to the markets with remarkable speed. In Shenzhen, for example, cell phones can go from conceptual design to production ready in 29 days. Products are market tested directly by throwing small batches of several thousand pieces of a given product into the market. If there is demand and they sell quickly, more will be produced. So there is a commitment to never building anything from scratch, similar to the open source maker movement. But again, it's, it's incorporated directly into production and into making a profit. A particular social dynamic is crucial to this manufacturing-centered design process I've just described. Personal and business lives blend, and important decisions with regards to investments, release dates, and collaboration partners are often made over informal dinner meetups and weekend gatherings. 
These social connections are central to getting business done in Shenzhen. Shenzhen's population comes from elsewhere. More than 95% of the city's population is migrants. It is not only the promise of a better income, but the hopes for a different future that motivates hundreds of thousands of migrant workers every year to seek employment in Shenzhen, often far away from their hometowns and families sending back remittances. Though, as is widely reported, there's issues with sweatshop labor in Shenzhen. Many of the people that I met during my research and that I interviewed promote Shenzhen as full of opportunities, a dream city, a place where you can make it in China today. So many who enter the Shenzhen ecosystem, for instance, do not come from privileged socioeconomic backgrounds. Take, for instance, Yi Ke Wu, who is the manager of a Shenzhen tablet company. Wu is one of the few who made it in Shenzhen. His company has revenue over several million US dollars every year, shipping tablets to South America, Eastern Europe, Russia, and the United States. Wu originally came to Shenzhen at the urging of a relative who was working at the Chinese car manufacturer BYD, Build Your Dream, who helped Wu, who helped Wu um, to get a corporate scholarship that funded his college education. After college, Wu entered what he calls the Shanghai community. He made a name for himself by leading a development team that produced one of the first copycat versions of the Apple iPad. The localized, slightly altered version of the tablet was introduced into the Chinese market before Apple had officially released the iPad in the United States. <laughs> this did, of course, not go by unnoticed by bigger players in the Shanghai ecosystem. Wu explained to me how, once one has gained trust and made a name for themselves, it was easy to find partners quickly and also getting resources and funds and investments from them. So Shanghai production in that sense is very fast and nimble, um, partially due to this very unique social fabric. So with decisions about new products, designs, and pricings are made collaboratively and together. This process, though, entails people to be on 24-7. Every personal interaction, no matter if offline or online, is also about furthering a collective goal. The expansion and spread of business opportunities, the discovery of niche markets, and the distillation of new mechanisms that will generate more sales and revenue. In this way, the Zhangjie ecosystem reminds eerily of Silicon Valley, with its male-dominated management and entrepreneurial leadership, hard-striving work ethic and peer pressure, all of which forms a close-knit community of informal socializing and information sharing. People who lack the financial resources, like Wu, for example, at the beginning of his career, nevertheless receive support from within this larger Shanghai social network. People become part of the social network by participating in both informal face-to-face -face gatherings I was already talking about, but also networking via mobile social media platforms such as WeChat. Much of the offline activity takes place over alcohol-infused meals, KTV bars, and massage parlors, establishments that are frequented by a largely male clientele. This grassroots community who, com who is comprised of people who are driven and hardworking, committed to improving the standard of living and whose primary goal was to make money, is thriving through these informal gatherings. Many considered the level of entrepreneurial possibilities as very unique to Shenzhen. So this is a quote from one of my interlocutors. There is no other place like this in China. Here you find a lot of opportunities. You can become yourself. You can realize your dream. You can make a story out of your life. In the last few years, then, Shenzhen has begun to draw yet another wave of migrants. Mobile elites, such as tech entrepreneurs, hackers, makers, geeks, and artists, who are drawn to the city's abundance of materials and the production processes located there. For these newcomers, very often the first stop in Shenzhen are the markets of Huaqiang Bay, a 15 by 15 city block area filled with large department store buildings. Each mall contains a labyrinth of stalls spread over several floors. Malls specialize in everything from basic components, such as LEDs, resistors, buttons, capacitors, wires, and boards to, pr to products such as laptops, phones, security cameras, and some of these Shanghai phones that I pass around are from these markets. For makers, the markets provide immediate access to tools, components, and expertise. So what draws tech entrepreneurs, makers, and designers to Shenzhen is that ideation, design, market testing, and industrial production evolve together in an iterative process. As you see in this quote here by maker Ian Lesnar from Dangerous Prototypes, makers perceive Shenzhen as unique because as they describe it, it's a tactile and deeply embodied design process that requires close connections with both materials and the local <coughs> skill sets that many describe as highly professionalized 
a highly professional uh, form, professionalized form of making in action. Living in Zhenzhen is like living in a city-sized tech shop, says Zach Hirkin Smith, for example, who is one of the co-founders of the well-known 3D printing company, MakerBot Industries. Smith came to Shenzhen when MakerBot Industries actually started to collaborate with local manufacturing businesses around 2012. Since then, he has spent many years working and living in the city and has learned to adapt to what he calls Shenzhen's native design language. And he told me, if you come to Shenzhen, you're going to take your American design language and you're going to have to translate it. If you're out here and you can start to learn that local design language and start using it in your own designs, it helps you make designs that are easier to manufacture because you're not substituting a bunch of stuff. People out here can build their designs in this native way. As you go and meet with manufacturers, you understand their design process, how they want to build things, or what they are capable of building. This changes the way you want to do your design because as a designer, if you're a good designer, you're going to try and adapt to these techniques instead of making the techniques adapt to you. In April 2014, Dale Doherty visited Shenzhen for the first time. Dale Doherty is the founder of Make Magazine, a periodical of DIY hacking projects and tutorials that has proliferated or helped proliferate the maker spirit beyond maker and hacker spaces. Upon his visits, uh, visit, Dale Doherty reflects, if you are in Detroit and you just want to get something made, that's difficult because the manufacturers are used to talking to auto companies. Even if those auto companies aren't talking to them because they don't have any work, they still don't want to mess with you, and you meaning like the individual maker or the entrepreneur. I started Maker Fair in Detroit. One of the events I did the first year was I had makers coming up and they'd say, I live in the manufacturing capital of America and I can't, and I can't get things made. So much of what we see with regards to maker entrepreneurialism in Zhenzhen um, and the enthusiasm for Zhenzhen as we see in this quote, goes back to the early efforts of Seed Studio, which is a Chinese hardware facilitator that connects Shenzhen's world of manufacturing with the global maker movement. Seed Studio was founded in 2008 by the then 26-year-old Eric Pan and grew quickly from a two-people startup into a successful business that has now more than 10 million US dollars revenue per year. Seed sells hardware kits, microcontroller platforms, and custom-made printed circuit boards mostly to makers abroad. It also provides highly personalized services. One of Seed's core businesses is to enable hardware and maker startups to move from an idea to mass production by identifying what Eric Pan calls so-called pain points, moments of transition where a company lacks the knowledge of how to scale up and when to scale up. Eric Pan, the founder of Seed Studio, has become an influential voice of China's own maker scene, eager to demonstrate that made in China can mean something more than just copycats and cheap labor. The first thing one reads when entering the offices of Seed Studio is the tagline, Innovate with China, painted on a large mural wall. A pun on the Made in China brand, it is also the label that adorns Seed Studio products, as you see here on the screen. So what motivated this new slogan or tagline? In an interview, Eric Pan explained to me, when I came to the US in 2010, people knew they knew us and liked our products, so they, they knew and liked Seed Studio products, but nobody wanted to believe that we are a Chinese company. Nobody had thought that cool and innovative products could come out of China. That's why ever since, we've been using Innovate with China on our product labels to demonstrate that manufacturing in China can mean partnership and innovation instead of cheap labor and low quality. So innovate, in China, innovate with China in that sense is aimed at intervening into conceptions of what counts as good design and that it would be inherently located in Western design centers like Silicon Valley. It challenges the widespread conception of technology production which splits manufacturing and design along geographical lines. Technology is conceived and designed in the West and then outsourced to manufacturing um, to low wage regions with loose regulatory um, environments. The evidence of this dominant idea of innovation is emblazoned on the iPhone, designed by Apple in California and assembled in China. Designers here are understood as the agents, with their ideas being executed elsewhere. In its most extreme formulation, this division corresponds to a Cartesian-inspired mind-body dualism in which an active rational mind in the West guides a passive inert body in the so-called developing world. 
What many makers like Eric Pan, David Lee, Zach Smith, and many others that I interviewed and spent time with emphasize is that this binary does not exist in practice. They speak about this, how, what is central to production and electronic production in particular is a form of collaboration and partnership that unfolds on the factory floor. So design and design thinking happens as part of the engineering process rather than before and guiding manufacturing. So this is what Innovate with China is trying to intervene in. So Innovate with China then is a vision to remake what China does and what it stands for through manufacturing. While the Chinese government has long promoted to overcome manufacturing and establish China as a global knowledge economy, the vision of Innovate with China rests on harnessing Chinese manufacturing as the country's asset for its future. China's makers are, are simultaneously in the sense then aligning with and reworking official discourse. They align with and in part benefit from official promotions of making and innovation. They differ, however, where they locate innovation. While the Chinese government envisions a future of innovation to be located, located in the buildup of maker spaces, fab labs, and incubator programs, China's makers argue that innovation is to be found in China already today, not in Western imports like the maker space or the fab lab, but in the repair workshops on the streets of China's cities, in the tacit knowledge of factory workers on the assembly line, and the open manufacturing ecosystem of Shanghai. What I want to emphasize here is that hacking and making is very often understood, particularly here in the United States, as a countercultural movement. The story of China's makers evidences the limitations of this view. The vision of Innovate with China is not directed as escaping the system, but at making use of it, making fun of it, altering it, provoking it. I argue that rather than a counterculture, making is better understood as a parasitic culture in how Jeremy Barmey uses the term. Providing a detailed historical account of China's 1980s and 1990s avant-garde and pop art scene, Barmey stresses the importance of resisting common analytical binaries, such as the dominant social order versus subculture. Illustrating how the state leveraged dissident artists for claims over national cultural production and how artists exploited that very state support, Barmey suggests, quote, non-official culture can also be spoken of as parallel or even parasitic culture. As such, it is neither non-official nor necessarily anti-official. Much of it was and still is produced with state funding and certain official or state involvement by me stresses. Makers in China align with promotions of tech entrepreneurialism. They do not hesitate to take advantage of foreign venture capital and they exploit political promotions of China's remake. So I've shown in this talk today how makers in China align with often contradictory ideas and establish partnerships with seemingly opposing entities, all the way from Shanghai copycat, Shanghai innovation culture, um, governments, um, foreign investors, and so on. As yet another example, what you see on the screen is a document that makes Eric Pan, the founder of Seed Studio, I've introduced earlier, a member um, of the Zhenzhen PCC, the political consultative conference. So quite a big political commitment there. What I wish to emphasize then here is that China's maker culture is neither straightforward countercultural nor pro system. In order to account for these at times symbiotic, at other times um, parasitic partnerships and alliances, analytical categories such as tactic versus strategy or state versus netizen, which is the term that's very often used for internet users in China, are no longer sufficient. For the makers I work with, entering partnerships between and with these diverse stakeholders constitutes a way to position themselves in a world they perceived as inherently in flux. They refused to be caught up in an urban, economic, technological, and social transformation of China. And in this refusal, they promote the intersection of making and manufacturing as the site for individual empowerment within unstable and shifting worlds as it enables them to remake the very societal norms and material infrastructures that undergird their work and livelihood. Maker entrepreneurialism in this sense is not directed at escaping the system, but at making use of it, making fun of it, altering it and provoking it. It's in that sense, I suggest, parasitic. And with this, I would like to thank you and take questions. I see that uh, China has the same gender problem that we have here with maker spaces and things. There's 
really underrepresented. Women are what underrepresented. Uh, how do you see that changing in the future? Well, um, there's a lot of efforts around changing that from within the maker community, right? So it's, it's what many calls of the limitations of making or, so you see that happening on both sides. So you see feminist hackerspaces, for example. Um, there are several feminist hackerspaces in the United States, but also in Europe. So within, within the sort of broader maker community, there's quite a big of debate around, that, around those things. And making is very often also used within educational programs to actually promote a hands-on tinkering approach towards STEM education, suggesting that that can actually you know, bring into the sciences um, populations that would usually be excluded from making. So that's, there's a lot of investment in that space. It has become quite a political project. On the other hand, when you look at professional making and manufacturing in China, there is, there is as there is here too, a lot of women who actually perform work, important work that is very often not visible. So for example, the hardware incubator I was researching at was run by two women who were the administrators who basically established connections to the factories for these foreign startups who didn't speak Chinese um, and for whom it was very hard you know, to establish close partnerships with these Chinese manufacturers. So these women would take over that role of not only introducing people but negotiating contracts and partnerships and relationships. So I think what is very important is to point to the ways in which women are already participating and performing important work in these sites, but it's not necessarily the work that is usually rendered as cool or that a VC pays attention to when the startups are pitching in Silicon Valley about the work that they're performing in China. Educational, uh, I guess, after effects of this kind of movement. You're talking about a, a, a new trend in manufacturing that's stressing creativity and grassroots innovation and sharing how you know, this kind of thing. And I'm wondering whether, I, 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 I know I've read um, in the past few years articles talking about how the Chinese educational culture, we're thinking or theorizing about secondary education, particular college level education and beyond, uh, has taken as one of its objectives of a creative class is going to be more capable of generating the kind of groundbreaking technical innovations and other kinds of innovations that uh, the technocrats aspire to. And I'm wondering whether the success of this kind of model in Shenzhen uh, generates, as an after effect, any kind of shift that you're aware of in terms of educational rhetoric, in terms of you know, how people um, beyond the restricted technical field might go about creating the kinds of people who are going to succeed and prosper and thrive in this kind of mm -hmm. So there's a lot of effort in, in different Chinese universities right now. So um, Tsinghua, Tongji University, Tiao Tong University, Fudan um, are in the middle or already have set up their own maker spaces and fab labs. So you see in higher education a clear commitment and effort to participate in these kinds of hands-on learning environments, you know, uh, support students in, in entrepreneurial thinking, incubator programs that are part of these universities. So that's, that's definitely happening, and there is investment from, the, from local governments in that. At the same time, you see sort of in the middle school and high schools um, much less of, of these kinds of initiatives. So what a lot of the maker spaces in these cities are doing is kind of filling a gap. So a lot of so the, the, maker, the hacker space in Shanghai, for example, works with the local library, um, the Tushu Guan in Shanghai, to host um, educational workshops on the weekends, which mostly attracts parents and their children. <laughs> Uh, f you know, and many of them sort of um, talk about it as a way for exposing their children to a new form of education that is about creativity. So very much so adopting that, that creative industry, that sort of creative discourse or discourse of creativity that has been around in China since the WTO entrance, right? So, I mean, I think what you see now with Lee Keqiang and sort of these most recent promotions of making as yet another site of innovation is, I think, a, a political discourse that tries to bridge between what has been promoted over the last 10 years of this buildup of a creative class, of a creative and knowledge economy by utilizing though making um, as, a, as a sort of tactic to actually revamp um, educational, in particular sort of like entrepreneurship kind of programs. But it's yet to be seen, you know, what other kinds of initiatives are gonna actually be supported over the next years and months. It's gonna move fast, I'm sure. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm curious how specific all this is for Shenzhen, how affordable it is for other places. You seem to be saying that Shanghai is kind of ahead of the curve, seems to be other places. And 
So we see it spreading out, you know, in different ways in different parts of China, depending on what's on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of interest in one of our PhD students, Yen here, is, uh, for example, working with some family f and friends in, in his hometown to set up a makerspace um, in Changsha, which is yet in another part of China. So I think you see as, you know, stories and ideas about what making can mean with regards to changing China and um, creativity and innovation, you will see more and more efforts also outside of the big international cities. I mean, Zhenzhen is in that sense fairly unique because of its manufacturing history and, and sort of the, the, the attention it has got recently. Intel just invested in December 100 million US dollars in what they call the China technology ecosystem. So Intel has its own term for the city of Shenzhen. So I think you, you will see probably a lot of what, what is going to happen over the next years come out of some of these hubs, but then infiltrate into other regions because of individual people's efforts, because they're excited about what's going on. Yeah, Mary. So I have a question about um, what's an obvious probably topic when you're talking about the, these issues, which is related to intellectual property and how people think about um, intellectual property when they create something and how they sort of proportion. But because it's profit motivated, they have to think about how do you um, how do you give ownership over IP so that people can can make profitable products? So I'm not so much interested in how multinationals interact with Shanghai. I think maybe it's the lawsuits, but how do people um, in this culture think about apportioning intellectual property? And and if there's a dispute about it amongst the people who are mm -hmm. in these informal social networks, how do they resolve the dispute? Yeah, that's a great question. So. I've been looking a lot at these sort of um, tensions around IP and copy um, between the maker entrepreneurs and the Zhanzhai sort of manufacturing entities. So um, what a lot of the makers and, and entrepreneurs, when they come to Shenzhen, the question they usually get is, well, don't you have to worry about IP? And, and how are you going to handle this? And can you even afford that as this small startup? What are you, well, how are you going to tackle this? And it, it's, it's something that um, the startups mostly worry about with regards to how they promote their work. So when they're on the ground in Zhenzhen, they um, usually think of themselves um, and think of Zhanzhai as very much so in alignment with regards to their attitude and spirit. So the makers as much, especially those committed to open source hardware and open source sharing, feel very much so aligned with the Zhanzhai spirit with regards to open sharing, a very tight-knit, closed social community. So there's kind of like an alignment in attitudes, even though it's motivated and historically grown quite differently. So again, looking beyond sort of these big internationals, right, sort of the smaller startups benefit actually from that somewhat sort of messy, um, not quite controlled environment of open sharing. And through that, you know, sort of we're thinking of Shanghai and, and sort of the manufacturing scene really also as a way for them to learn in different ways. Now for the Shanghai, and I think your question was in part about people in the Shanghai system themselves, and there is a lot of sort of tensions right now, especially as the government is now paying more attention to Shenzhen again. Um, so I was just recently at the Shenzhen Industrial Design Fair, which has on display branded products next to Shanghai products, some of them you know, similar to the ones that I passed around. And there's sort of a clear aspiration of moving sort of along the line of having more and more branded sort of artifacts, right? And sort of following a sort of Western um, regime of intellectual property and, and sort of copyright infringement. So there, you can see that there's this weird tension on the one hand, the government trying to promote what is unique about Shenzhen and leveraging that and making an argument for that while at the same time trying to sort of um, look international and look like Western design. So I think these tensions are really fascinating, and that's a, basically a continuous process of negotiation. Yes. What is um, the free for carrier thoughts on what the capacity is for um, present Chinese hackers, either maliciously or in, um, in curiosity, hacking like industrial um, um, departments? sensitive um, organizations in the United States that you can read about uh, hacking by the Chinese. I just wonder how sophisticated they are, if they're tinkering. Mm -hmm. So I don't study illegal hacking in that sense. Yeah, so these, the, these makers, hackers working 
in and around entrepreneurship, maker spaces, very often distance themselves from this type of illegal hacking. Um, and there's a continuous debate both in the global maker community and in local maker communities around what does making mean, what does hacking mean. And, and many people in this particular community associate with making and hacking this unblack boxing of technology that's designed for people by large corporations like Apple. So these are people committed to saying, rather than you buying the iPhone, why don't we design our own phone? Uh, why do, you know, and they, they think of that as a form of empowerment, as a resistance to consumer culture, to passive consumer culture, as individual empowerment through technology production, that if you learn how to produce your own technology, you are going to be able to intervene not also in production, but also in economic processes and into creating your own businesses and, and making choices about your own livelihood. So now I can really not speak to this other side of illegal hacking because it's not, it's not what I looked at in my own research. Would there be like a prior rogue group? Distinct? No, it's a very different, it's a very no. different community. Yeah. Okay, I just think of it as there very might be you know, There might be some individuals who perhaps bridge across these different scenes. So one of the earlier, before the first hackerspace opened in Shanghai, a very influential community was the, the Chinese internet bloggers, like Isaac Mao, for example, some of you might know. And he was very much so bordering on this line of like challenging state censorship, intervening um, in state censorship uh, through setting up VPNs and so on. So there was that type of craftiness with sort of control and internet control. But again, it wasn't quite on that side of like illegal hacking into foreign entities. Well, thank you. Yes. Well, when they say hackerspace, what, why did they use that term? I mean, in my <laughs> kind of lay understanding, hacking only meant breaking into somebody else's system. But why did they use hackerspace for this term? So hacking in many ways, that term has been around in particular in the US since sort of I mean, it was really sort of like, you know, became, has become part of sort of um, public awareness in the 1960s and 70s with the internet counterculture, you know, like Stephen Levy writing about sort of hacking culture. Well, right? None. So again, even back then in the 60s and 70s, people identified with hacking as a way to say we build technology that's not part of the post Cold War military industrial complex. We make and hack our own technology, again with this motivation to design technology for other people, for them to openly use it and modify it and adopt it. And these people sort of would describe that particular computing culture as a hacker culture, not in that sense of like illegally hacking into closed systems, but challenging how technology is being within designed. Within the in group, but it seems to be for the people outside that group, mm -hmm. hacking only has the, the yeah. in. And hacking still has very negative connotations. Yeah. Yep. And that's why a lot of people sort of really debate about should we call it a makerspace or a hackerspace? So when, when Xin Shijian, the first hackerspace in Shanghai was set up, there was a huge debate on one of the mailing lists if it should, what the Chinese term for it should be. And there's a Chinese term, heike, which translates as hacker and is usually referring to this illegal hacking into a system. So the community at that time decided to use the Chinese term chuang ke, so chuang yi which is used in creativity, which connotes creativity and innovation, basically. So the meaning not being then hacker, but more like that maker, the, the creative professional. And also Make Magazine here in the United States was Dale Doherty, who I mentioned, was in the beginning considering naming his magazine Hacks. And then he got feedback from people who were like, you will never bring this into schools. You will never be able to revamp education. And then he called it Make. So it's, it's a very good point that hacking still has this sort of negative connotation. Has all this creativity and dynamism of Shenzhen had any effect on the political situation? Or is that too big a question? You mean the larger political? Yes. I mean, it's sort of ironic as you read around sort of clamping down on VPNs and sort of tightening internet control that at the same time Li Keqiang is supporting makers, right? That has been very recent, some of these quotes I put up there from this year, you know, in late 2014. So, I mean, it's yet to be seen, I think. So you, so you see local governments being quite supportive of, of what's going on, right? Um, but Li Keqiang, I mean, that's, you know, that's big government, so. I'm wondering how you can keep a lid on all this. How you can meet, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and it's, it's going to be a continuous negotiation process. So I was just WeChatting with Eric Pan from Seed Studio today because I, I put up this slide, right? His, oops, sorry. Uh, him joining the PCC, right? And I asked him about that. I'm like, so how does this feel? What does this mean for your work, you know? And um, he is continuously worried about just ending up doing all this work of being like in official meetings and pleasing the government. And he gets, the company gets frequent visits. Every week, you know, somebody from the local government is stopping by and he says, I'm so exhausted, you know, I have to, I have to keep doing this work. This, of course, is an opportunity. He's going to have a say in policy, right? So he, he, he's conflicted about that. Maybe turn to one more question. Just following up on that, um, here we have something called civic hacking, civic tech, like Ann Arbor civic tech mm -hmm. meetup, um, where you take problems in government and help solve them as makers. I'm guessing they really don't have that started yet in China. <laughs> there was one, I mean, you know, yes, so the US government is the White House Make a Fair National Civic Day of Hacking, right, is what you're referring to. And data.gov. Right. So there's, there's a lot of in that space happening around open data and um, big data cities and redesigning cities with sort of an open data sort of reform in mind. So there's got to be a lot of stuff happening there. And there was also just recently in, I, th I believe that was September 2012, or a little bit before that, there was a US maker, US China maker competition, which was supported by the Chinese government and the US government. And politicians from both sides came in. And again, it wasn't so much about civic hacking in that sense, but again, it was about you know, instilling sort of ideals of entrepreneurialism and, and getting people on board with building for a social, for social impact and starting companies with a social entrepreneur mindset. Um, and social entrepreneurship is quite big in China, but you see it sort of mostly on a grassroots level, I would say. Yeah, but. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for all these questions. This is great. <laughs>